Good morning. It is 11 o'clock and it is a beautiful sunny day and warm day here in Ithaca, New York. And um, I am Jana Hexter. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to our webinar this morning. And um, the topic is the biology and management of troublesome invasive species in the Northeast. And so I know it's um, uh, something that is of interest to a lot of people. And um, I am delighted to uh, welcome Tony Di Tommaso uh, to be our presenter today. So um, a few little housekeeping things before we get into the topic. Um, we have a lot of people um, registered. We have over 500 people registered for this webinar, and it looks like we have 175 people on live. Um, so um, we'll do our very best to uh, manage it in a, in a way that works for everyone, but um, we, I'm, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions and, um, and a lot of uh, chat. So. Um, so I'm going to, um, there is going to be um, a recording of this webinar and um, it'll be available in about a week. Um, you'll also get um, a copy of the, the chat and the Q&A. Uh, for you to go over. The link um, for where you'll find it is here, but I will send you an email as soon as it's ready with a, with a copy of the link. And uh, the live transcription uh, should be uh, should be made, uh, should be available to you right now. And I will double check that in a moment. Um, we welcome your questions and I'm sure you have lots of questions. I know you have lots of questions because you've already been asking them via email. <laughs> so um, this is how we're going to handle questions because we have a lot of people. Um, do not use the chat. Uh, you can use the chat for making comments or um, um, talking to each other. If you want to ask a question, use the Q&A feature. So if you go to where that black uh, line uh, lives, in the middle of that is a box that says Q&A. If you click on there, you can uh, type your question in and um, you can also ask it anonymously. Uh, feel free to use that feature if you if you would like to. And uh, we'll do our best to answer the questions that come in. Um, but the last time Tony did um, a webinar for us um, in the fall, there were more questions and can possibly be humanly handled in the time available. Um, so we'll do our very best to, uh, to accommodate as many as we can. Um, and um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Tony Di Tommaso. He's a professor of weed science and chair of the soil and crop sciences section in the School of Integrative Plant Science at Cornell University. His primary areas of scholarship focus on the biology, ecology, and management of important agricultural weeds and introduced invasive plants of natural and semi-natural areas in the Northeastern US and Southern Canada. Uh, Dr. Tommaso has published over 145 scientific articles and 12 book chapters. Most recently, um, he is the co-author of the book Weeds of the Northeast, a second edition, and Manage Weeds on Your Farm, a Guide to Ecological Strategies, and we'll provide links to both of those um, with the recording. Um, he has served as editor-in-chief of the scientific journal Invasive Plant Science and Management since 2015. So welcome, Tony. Great. Thanks, Yana, and uh, welcome, everybody. I know, like Yana said, this is a great day out here in terms of weather in the Ithaca area, and it's uh, certainly, um, many of you are probably avid gardeners. I'm already starting to feel the urge to get into that garden, but I'm also afraid of what kind of weeds I'm likely to see. Um, so um, it's kind of apropos that uh, we're doing this seminar today because I, um, some of you might know um, this week is uh, National Invasive Species Awareness Week, uh, NISA, uh, out in particular in, in D D.C. There are actually a bunch of webinars uh, all, the whole entire week, and you might want to take a look at it. Um, I know the, uh, the link was just put, put on there. Um, some really, really good good seminars as well, but I just thought it was kind of um, you know, it, it worked out well for us to be talking about uh, invasive species. So uh, a couple of things just to mention, as, as Jana said, there are a lot of folks online, a lot of interest. Obviously, it's, it's something we're always, you know, grappling with. So, um, you know, I selected 12 of what I felt were, you know, common species that often I get asked about in terms of management. There are certainly way more number of species that are, uh, are going to be um, of interest to you. Certainly, if you want to include those either in, in chat or in the questions, I'll um, at the end of the you know the webinar, I'll try to take a look. 
and see if I can um, address some of those uh, some of those questions. So um, with that, um, the other thing, if we can maybe uh, Yana move to our first um, our yep. first slide. Yeah, um, actually, before we do that, we're going oh. to just ask some polling questions. You'll see uh, most of you should see up on your screen uh, three questions, and it gives us an idea of who is here. And um, whoops, something just funny happened with my computer. Uh, who is here and your level of uh, knowledge about invasive species. And uh, so if you can just answer those questions, that would be wonderful. And OK, great. You all just all right. So I'm going to share the results. And um, most people are somewhat knowledgeable, moderately knowledgeable. We have seven people who are extremely knowledgeable about the biology of troublesome invasive species. Um, and how to manage, manage trouble some invasive species. Mostly, most people fall into somewhat and moderately, a few are very, and two are extremely. And um, how knowledgeable are you about the use of IPM in the Northeast for troublesome invasive species? And same, most people fall into the somewhat uh, knowledgeable, moderately knowledgeable. And uh, we looks like we have about 22 people for, who fall into the very knowledgeable or extremely knowledgeable category. So well, thank you for everyone who is here. And uh, with that, we will move into the slides. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Jana. Well, it's great to have that, that a true, you know, variety of, of expertise. And again, uh, by no means Am I, um, do I know everything about all these species? And so I really do um, hope that some of you have had more experience with some of the species that I'll be talking about are, are willing to share your knowledge and expertise uh, with the uh, other participants. Uh, again, it ranges from, you know, very, you know, um, very knowledgeable to kind of, hey, just getting started or I know a little bit about this uh, species. So one thing that I wanted to say up front was, what I'll be looking at when I'm thinking about invasive species, I'm really focusing on non-native species, particularly to the Northeast, but generally to North America, and species that I would call problematic or troublesome, in the sense that they are not easily managed and and uh, you know are fairly aggressive. I mean, a lot of our weeds, we can we can say that is true of them, but in this case. These are species that, um, as, as you will see, are kind of the who's who of, of, of invasive species. So let's keep that in mind because there are some native species that can also be invasive, but I really tried to narrow it down. And here it gives you a sense of the species that I'm hoping to cover. I mean, there's a lot of them there and many of you will recognize a whole bunch of these and say, absolutely, I, these are kind of species I need, I'm dealing with. Um, and I've got them in the uh, kind of annual uh, category, Japanese stiltgrass, um, and then kind of a whole bunch of in, in herbaceous perennials. And the theme here is perennials, because those are the real tough ones to control, because they usually have underground storage organs that allow them to reproduce vegetatively. So we'll talk from, go from Japanese knobweed and hybrids all the way to common reed. Uh, swallow warts and, and bindweeds, again, uh, many will be familiar to you, or at least you're hoping to learn a little more about them. And then kind of moving into the shrubs, uh, looking at things like uh, multiflora rose and buckcorn, uh, buckthorn and the honeysuckles. Uh, I mean, I could have included in there privet, ligristrum, you know, the uh, tree of heaven if we get into the trees. But it's just, again, we're limited by time. Um, but this gives you an idea, and, and hopefully if you have questions, uh, allow me to go through uh, the species, and if there's something afterwards that's of interest to you or you would like to share with the group, um, that, would be, that would be great. So um, we'll move to our next slide. And so let's start with, with our, an annual grass. So remember, for those of you who are not as familiar, and, and again, I apologize to those of you who are really you know, experts in this, I just want to remind an annual is a plant that basically reproduces uh, only by seed. So it will go from one generation to the next only by seed. So and that's important because you've got to think about the biology, ecology of these species to be able to think about uh, effective management. And knowing that it's an annual, one of the key things is you probably would like to, to stop its, its seed production. So what do we know about annual stilt grass? Um, uh, so Japanese stilt grass, sorry. Uh, some people call it Mary's grass, and there's a lot of common names. Um, it's an annual, reproduces by seed. 
Uh, usually is killed by a pretty hard frost. Um, it's got a hairy color, uh, collar uh, region. Um, and again, uh, if you do have a copy of the Weeds of the Northeast, that second edition, we really focus on, you know, on the on the identification part of it. But I'm, I'm hoping most of you are familiar. Um, what, one important feature relative to many other grasses is that the leaf plate is much wider than our typical grasses like crabgrass or, or barnyard grass. So that gives it away. And it typically has a very shallow uh, fibrous root. So these are some of the, the, the generalities. Hopefully most of you are familiar with this plant um, that you can kind of think about um, or, or be able to identify it in, in the wild. So it's definitely an, an aggressive invader, uh, usually of shaded areas. We are seeing more and more of our forest areas invaded by Japanese stilt grass in, the, in our region. Um, and uh, usually wet areas, but um, it's, it's um, and it can also, you know, I've, I've had to deal with it in, uh, and I included it in there, low maintenance turf. Uh, once it gets established, very difficult to, to kind of control it. You might not be surprised that deer do not like it. So guess what? They, they you know, deer will selectively browse and, and leave this plant to uh, basically to itself. So um, from a noun management, uh, so the way I'm going to set this up is give you some information on non-chemical control. Uh, by no means is this an exhaustive list, but it'll give you a sense of how easy, how difficult it is to control. And most of this information has come either from scientific literature, personal experience, or talking to land managers, folks like many of you who are probably have expertise in this. So... Um, for small infestations, and you'll hear this in some cases over and over again, you can actually hand pull these things out. But when you've got, you know, 10 acres of a forest understory, it's just not going to happen, right? Um, and, and you know, trimming it, mowing frequently will, um, you know, will, the key is to try to stop seed production. But again, if you're in a forest understory, you can't really be getting in there mowing. Uh, very, very difficult. I have seen flame weeding work in some cases. Uh, particularly in, in moist sites. And the, uh, the caution here is that you don't want to start fires um, if it's a very dry area. But I've seen in very, very localized prescribed burns, uh, the plants were killed. And again, uh, the plant only reproduces by seed. One important aspect of me, you know, controlling this plant is that once you've controlled it, either by herbicide or non-chemical, really important to get in there and reseed the area because this species does like Germination is stimulated by light and, and no competition, basically. So including uh, seeding it over, um, that would be that'd be very helpful. Um, this is a lot of information when it comes to herbicides. And uh, by no means the, are you expected to just remember all of these, but this is out of the literature and what I can pull together. Now we have many of you are not all from, you know, either New York State, you're from all over. Uh, and so I want to make kind of a cautionary note that not all of these products, these herbicides are likely um, available in your region. So you really de do need to check with your local cooperative extension uh, or, or, you know, look at what is available in your in your region. And um, and also extremely important to follow the label. As many of you know, the label, the herbicide label is the law. And so you really do need to, to follow that. So it's those examples that I provide is, is more for guidance. Um, and just if you're wondering, for those of you who are kind of um, not as familiar with herbicides, a pre-emergent herbicide is one that's applied before the, the weed basically germinates. So you apply it to the soil surface and then with rain rainwater and so forth, it will inhibit the germination of the species. Whereas something called post or post-emergent post herbicide is applied once the, the weed or the invasive has emerged through the soil and it's got leaves. So you're basically applying it to the leaves. So um, again, because this is a grass, for those of you who are familiar with herbicides, we typically use a what's called a group one herbicides, the, uh, the FOPs and DIMs as we refer to them. Uh, but those give you kind of a general, general idea. And my hope is that you will, you will go back to the slides and be able to, to look at some of those products and see which ones are available in your region or you might be familiar with. So um, I hope that's not overwhelming you with, with this information, but I just thought it'd be best to 
put it out there, and then on your own, you could kind of go back in the presentation and look at these. Oh, let's let's move. And Yana's going to keep me on on track here because um, you know I can go off and and speak about for thirty minutes just on on this one, Japanese knotweed or wild bamboo, as some folks call it. Oh, it's the weed we and the invasive we we all love and hate all at the same time. Our beekeepers love this plant um, for its 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 a nectar and and pollen source in in late July August, but it's a pretty difficult to control perennial broadleaf, uh, woody. Uh, uh, heart-shaped leaves, very beautiful, uh, long rhizomes. That's the rhizomes are really a, a problem with this species. So I think most of you recognize this plant, very difficult to control. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, very, um, it's, it's prefers these wet areas. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, you know, um, it's, it's just, I know, I don't know how many folks that love fishing say, you know, that once this this plant, you know, starts establishing along their favorite, uh, you know, uh, fishing holes, they can't, they can't get through it. It's just so impenetrable, very, very difficult to control, also on roadsides. So what can you do? Non-chemical control, you can cut it back, okay, uh, multiple times. This is one that you cannot just, if you're, you're not going to use herbicides, you're going to have to, it's going to be multiple cutting over a number, depending on the, on the um, you know, severity of the infestation, multiple times during the year, you're basically, and over multiple years, you're trying to exhaust the, under, the, the, the storage of, of carbohydrates in those rhizomes. And that's kind of what you're gonna be doing. Uh, the other thing I've seen is, is uh, after, after cutting it, um, you basically put in a very heavy tarp, and I've seen some around some some homes here in the Ithaca area. That's what some folks have been doing, especially in sloped areas. But look at how long some of these will take. I mean, this is a three to five year in really bad infestations. Um, and this plant will tend to kind of uh, scope out and try to get out of that that tarp and, and pop up. So you really do need to keep your, your eyes open. But this is a multiple season, uh, type approach. It's the only way that, that one can really look at it. Um, herbicides do work, uh, are fairly uh, effective, uh, but um, I can see that, um, you know, the glyphosate is, is probably, you know, an effective um, herbicide. We also have trichopyr, imazathapyr. I just noticed one of the, the chats saying, you know, I put tarp this is referring to this plant and it lifted the tarp. I am not surprised at all. I have seen that. That's why, you know, even a, you know, a heavy duty tarp is probably the best way to, to do it. Um, what they're now using in agricultural, uh, on agricultural farms to basically sol solarize the soil. But I am not surprised that this plant, this plant, the rhizomes will go through asphalt and concrete. You do not want this plant near your home or your foundation. It's something I tell all homeowners as beautiful, beautiful as it is, you just can't have it in there. We have had success with multiple seasons of, of use of glyphosate, either injected for small, injected into the stem or just repeated applications. And usually fall applications seem to, to work best. A quick note, um, it's also, Japanese knotweed is also very susceptible to frost, even a light frost. And you often will see that, uh, but it's got enough reserves that, that you just can't count on that, okay? So um, herbicidal, multiple seasons of herbicidal, just like cutting, um, will we'll, we'll cut it bad. But there's no doubt it's a very difficult plant to control. Um, thinking of uh, another plant that we've had a little more success with, this purple loosestrife, uh, a perennial broadleaf plant, world leaves, as it reproduces primarily by seed, although it has rhizomes, okay? Uh, please do not, I, I know none of you do this, Get out of your cars and go take it out of a ditch and bring it home because it's so pretty. This is not a pretty plant. It's pretty, but it's not a plant you want in your garden uh, or nearby in your flower garden. It's it's way too invasive. And these are the kind of colonies that it, it'll form. It basically, um, you know, will outcompete our native cattails. We also do, you know, and and basically it dries out any wet areas. Uh, tremendously, tremendously aggressive. Uh, species. We have had some, and I haven't included here, some luck with a, a beetle called Galuricella, 
uh, that's been released and it's actually done a pretty good job um, in some areas of the of central New York. Um, but I'm not sure how widespread the, the beetle is, but you know, we'll take whatever we can get. But I just wanted to, to note that. Uh, again, small infestations like any time, those are those are the ones that you can actually get control of. You really want to get to the flowers, make sure you don't have seed production. This is true of many of these species that reproduce primarily by seed. Um, again, I've seen people dig this thing out as roots and all, okay? Uh, we, we talked about, um, you know, rinsing clothing. The, the seeds can easily uh, be carried to other locations, even on your uh, equipment. And I usually, this is my own suggestion, I usually tell folks, please do not compost this plant. This is not one you, you want to compost just because each plant can produce 200,000 seeds. And you might not know that the plant, and, and it can be root actually in compost if you don't get high enough temperatures. Um, we have been uh, generally successful with um, emergent, mostly post-emergent herbicides. And I'll note that uh, where you see the double asterisks, uh, those are uh, herbicides that actually have been approved for aquatic areas. And you'll see that for many of our invasives that, that kind of uh, establish near waterways, that uh, there are specific formulations of Roundup, in this case glyphosate, that's specific in terms of how they're formulated to be a little safer near waterways. Um, and, and again, for those of you who kind of see this, Habitat or Imesapir, uh, Imesapir is, is actually been very effective. We have used it in some of some work that I've been involved in and it's, it's um, actually pretty effective. But again, you're looking at not everybody wanting to, to use herbicides, but um, the key with the species again is uh, keeping it from, from producing reproducing you know by seed again with each plant over 200,000 that's that's just way too much to be able to control in moving to one of my favorite species I've spent over, over 20 years of my career at Cornell looking at these species swallowworts up in Canada they call it the dog strangling vines for a reason these are uh, herbaceous vines uh, closely related to the milkweeds. Uh, some of you might have read some of the work uh, that's been published on these species. They're also a dead end for the monarch butterfly, which is really problematic in itself, but it's also a major invasive uh, that displaces many of our native species, particularly in the in south of Lake Ontario. We have some um, you know, very unique areas there, um, uh, shallow limestone soils. We're very uh, you know, unique native species. Uh, we have two species in the Northeast in Canada, um, pale and, um, and black. The pale is the, the photo to your, the bottom right. Uh, as you can see, those are the, the flowers and the, or, or even if we look at the photo up top right, uh, top corner is the black swallowwort. Look at the maroon purple flowers. That's the only way you can really tell them apart um, is, is by flower, um, unless you're an expert and, and can tell uh, from the, the seed pods. And the, and the pods tend to be these long, very similar to milkweed, but much longer and slender. And they basically, you know, open up and, and they also have the pappus, the dense. So seeds can be carried very, very far away. Um, I'll mention something about the, the species. They're polyembryonic, which is really cool or scary in the sense that each seed can produce multiple seedlings. So there are multiple embryos in each of those seeds, often two, three. Um, in, in, in here at Cornell, in our lab, we've counted as many as eight seedlings coming from that same seed, and they do not emerge at the same time, which is really problematic in the sense that you might chop one off and there's a second one that might come. But generally, more than half of those uh, uh, polyembryonic seeds will produce two or three seedlings. This is the kind of uh, area that uh, will be invaded. The species prefer open habitats, abandoned pastures. Okay, they can handle forest understories, particularly the pale, the black really prefers open habitats, but they basically choke out anything. Very, very aggressive and it's very difficult to, to, to you know, to move it, to move through. Again, small patches can be uh, controlled. Um, these plants have very, very uh, robust roots, particularly the pale swallowwort, uh, and so very difficult to control. Um, probably the best is to try to make sure they don't seed. Uh, the pods do not mature, so some folks can mow if you can do it in, in an open habitat, repeated mowing. But it's uh, in a study that we did here with a great colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Lindsay Milbright, USDA ARS, 
uh, even after six years of clipping and, and, and mowing, we never actually killed the plants. They were still able to come up uh, and, and emerge. So, um, you know, it's going to have to be repeated mowing over multiple seasons and reseeding. Um, some of you may know that there was a, a moth that was released as a biocontrol agent in, in New York and a number of other states, Hypena opulenta. Uh, unfortunately, from what I've heard from colleagues that work on it, it hasn't been the most efficient species. It tends to like forested areas. Uh, and that's now where swallowwort is most problematic. We want it to occupy sunny areas where the, the plant is really aggressive. Um, both the work that we've done in my lab, but also in, in, in other labs across the, the Northeast and Canada, uh, glyphosate works. Again, glyphosate, for those of you who are not familiar, or Roundup is a non-selective herbicide, which means it would kill everything, not just a swallowwort. So if you've got native species, this would not be your choice. But if you're trying to wipe, you know, clean out an area, definitely could do it. Uh, Roundup does not have any residual activity, which means the herbicide, once it hits the soil, it's not active. So you can certainly reseed and, and not injure other plants. Um, if you've got um, native grasses, for example, then uh, triclopyr or garlon is probably a good choice because it's selective for broadleaf weeds and, and, and provides decent control of swallower, not as good as Roundup. Um, so again, just putting that information out to you. And, um, and so again, uh, these species are definitely uh, expanding. Uh, a species that uh, some people are surprised, oh, uh, I've got this all over. I actually planted it in just under trees or in a shaded area because it's so pretty. It stays green throughout the winter. It seems to have these beautiful purple white flowers, common periwinkle, very aggressive uh, ground cover. And you can see why people like it because it's, it's, it's tremendously aggressive, uh, a creeping habit. Uh, again, purple to white, you can actually pull it out. You know, sometimes it's it's it's, it's got these stolons. It's you, you pull it out, you can see it rooting at all the all along it's uh, along the stem. So um, a pretty plant, but uh, we are having some major issues with this plant in particularly in forested areas. Um, uh, we have a project that actually we're doing over at Smith's Forests, which is a really, really nice primary forest here in the Trumansburg area of uh, central New York where we're trying to control this plant is, is taken over. So, um, you know, usually found in, in shaded areas, but it can occur near home sites. We've seen it in cemeteries, ditches. So you name the location, this plant can handle it. Um, mowing, that's part of the treatments we're, gonna, we're carrying out is mowing and then tarping. We're trying to see if uh, mowing in the fall and then uh, putting a tarp and we're gonna see, we just started the work last fall. Maybe some of you might already have a lot of experience on this, be happy to learn more for some of you. If you do have experience, uh, put it in the chat or in, in, the, in the questions. Uh, one thing that I always tell uh, folks is, is do rake the vines. They will reroot very easily. And it's another species I would never put in my compost uh, pile. It's just, just too problematic and it can reroot uh, very easily. Um, we are using Roundup in, in one of our treatments, so I'll be uh, interested and be happy to share it. Uh, the, once we have a better idea, we'll go out in May this year to look at it. But there are a bunch of other herbicides very familiar to some of you, Triclopyr, Um, Again, um, many of these have been proven to be effective in particular regions. So uh, again, the cautionary note, make sure that these are available in your region and do follow uh, the label. But um, herbicide control in some cases um, is, is, has, been, has been effective. Uh, Roundup is non-selective. So again, be careful if you're going to use this. It's mostly to clear out an area that's basically a monoculture uh, of these plants. If you need more selectivity, use imazapir and trichopyr. And they, on the label, they indicate uh, you know, what kind of um, you know, situations you can use these, these herbicides. And again, applying these. Uh, you know, uh, when the plants are actively growing, and that's kind of another key point for those of you who are not as familiar with herbicides, really important to apply, um, you know, uh, the, the herbicide when the plant is actively growing. You do not apply it when it's cold, the plant isn't growing, or it's drought stressed, because that herbicide will not be taken up by the plant. Um, another general comment that I can make is that often fall applied herbicides early fall are 
usually work best or after cutting, allowing the plant to grow after you mow or cut, allowing some vegetative growth and then applying the herbicide. But the reason that that works, the fall tends to work a little better is that the plant is kind of kicking in to winter mode, knowing that it's going to be winter. So it, it basically takes up all the nutrients and leaves and translocates them to below ground storage areas, roots, tubers, uh, rhizomes. And so the herbicide, the plant, if you apply the herbicide in the fall, the, the herbicide, something like LifeSafe, will basically hitch a ride with those carbohydrates in the phloem and move down. The plant doesn't recognize, you know, that, hey, this is this is likely to kill me. And just this, this is why those products tend to be effective in the fall. Whereas in the spring, the energy is going from below ground to above ground to get all that foliage up. Okay. Um, so... I'll, I'll just say some general general thoughts. Um, here's one that, boy, has just exploded over the last 10 years, I would say, at least in the Ithaca area and beyond, and something called lesser celandine, um, uh, which is just, just uh, it's this spring ephemeral. So for those of you not familiar with this plant, it just basically is out for about two to three weeks. I mean, today is totally unusual day. We're in our, the 50s here, but generally it would have been like in April, in mid-April for two to three weeks before trees leaf out, shrubs leaf out. It's in your, it's out there. So it, it it's a spring ephemeral, like many of our native ephemerals. And then after two to three weeks, it's flowers, it's done, it dies back. And if you have it in turf grass, it's terrible because you just see these, these brown patches. It's got those tubers. Uh, kidney-shaped leaves, okay, and they're very waxy. And I'll just mention this, please. Uh, I have seen too many home gardeners pass this plant along to their neighbor to plant because it's a beautiful, pretty plant, but it is by no means a pretty plant. It's often found in wet areas. Um, the tubers, the plant can actually move along in streams and be carried downstream. And we've seen that here in the Ithaca area where We've noticed, um, you know, initial establishment, and then folks were saying, "Hey, we're seeing it coming down the creek and establishing along the the shores, and then taking over." Um, you think of something like this, and then in two three weeks, just brown, nothing else. Uh, tremendously, um, again, it's a species that's 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 come on the radar, um, and and again, we see it now in lawns. And uh, this is what generally uh, folks have been spraying on uh, non. If you've got a big patch of it, um, glyphosate or rodeo is a good example. And again, it's it's labeled for near aquatic areas, again, because the plant tends to to uh, and enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. Great comment. Uh, often mistaken for native uh, marsh marigold. Absolutely. And in fact, in the weeds of the Northeast, we make that, that exact point uh, because we include this. We included the species and then we said, what are similar species? And one was like, do not, um, you know, confuse it. Uh, with and and so yes, great great point, and it's it's um, it's one that's that's um, and again, folks are providing some really really good uh, information about some of the herbicides and now you know the new labeling. Uh, like I said, I'm going to learn more from this than than probably some of you, which is great. Uh, but yeah, good point to be made. And again, if you want more selectivity, two uh, four D or tripopyr would probably be the, the better choices. Again, for those of you who are, who are interested in, in uh, you know, uh, chemical control, and in some cases, sometimes that's the only option. Uh, here's one of my favorites, mo mostly agricultural weeds. You'll see these, but I've seen them in so many gardens, uh, in orchards, uh, you name it. Uh, we do have two species. Um, we have, they're called the bindweeds. Please do not call these species morning glories. The morning glories are a separate group uh, that basically are annuals. These are perennials. And I know kind of people say, oh, I have some morning glories. Um, because one of the issues if in on herbicide labels, they'll say uh, this herbicide controls morning glories and not they're not referring to the bindweeds. They're referring to those annual weeds that pe people you have as ornamentals and, and so forth. Um, so these are, um, and, and one way you could tell the, the hedge bindweed from field if you look at the flower uh, on the in the middle frame there, and look at those two green bracts at the bottom of the flower, almost like candle holders, that's the uh, calistigia or the hedge bindweed. Uh, you don't see that in the and the flower is much larger than it is for the field bindweed. And you've got the leaves, 
Uh, on the left is the hedge bindweed, on the right is the field bindweed. They're both problematic. Even if you don't you know, have to you know, identify exactly what you have, they both have very deep rhizomes um, and very, very problematic. Probably one, the two of the species I get most uh, you know, questions about in gardens and, and uh, flower beds and in gardens that are particularly no-till. So uh, these species don't like to be, you know, to be disturbed. So where you cultivate annually, you typically won't find them. You're going to find them in your blueberry bushes, uh, raspberries, because, you know, you're typically not digging those up every year, right? So that's where those, those perennials, will we'll see them in, in ag land, in pastures, very problematic. Usually the top 10 weeds, agronomic weeds in the country are these, these species, but they're, I consider them invasive in, in many other habitats and they can get into even forest understories. Um, so keep that in mind. Again, um, if, if, if they're in areas where you can till or, you know, tillage, if, if, you know, basically disrupting the rhizomes, that works very well. Um, in, in ag systems, people uh, in organic systems, particularly folks will use cover crops. Um, you basically have to try to smother these, these plants. They're, they're very aggressive cultivation. Again, if you're, you're, they're in your blueberry bushes, it's pretty difficult to go in there. There you basically, um, what I've done, and I have some in my, is, is repeated cutting back, exhausting the, the root reserves. But again, I only have 12 blueberry plants. Some of you might have acres of this stuff. Very difficult to, to do that. But uh, mulching will certainly you know, help. They will come through. But again, those that come through, if you can kind of cut them back, they will. So mulching is, is probably one of the, the best way to, to handle these. Uh, hand weeding for home gardeners. But again, like anything, you've got to be persistent. None of these are easy. That's why they're on our top list. I wish they were that easy. We do have a... A range because they're mostly also agronomic weeds. The ag chemical industry certainly pays attention to them, and so they've um, they've invested in a lot of energy and and time and effort in in various herbicides that uh, generally have been uh, effective. Again, you would need to read the label. Where are you applying these? Uh, if you're applying a Roundup, obviously you're not going to be spraying it in your blueberry patch or raspberry patch because it's going to wipe out your blueberries. So be careful, read the labels as to what situations you can use them in what crops or what kind of, you know, uh, situations these are, are likely to be used. But um, by looking at the literature, we were able to, to pull these, these out uh, and, and give you an idea. And again, some are more effective, may be available in your region. But um, and again, post applications are those when, you, when the plant has already emerged. The leaves are out there. Whereas a pre-emergent is typically before the, the plants emerge from the soil. So imezapir is, is a good one. Uh, here's one that a, a, uh, I had not included in my list, not because it's not important, but just because of time. And uh, one of our uh, participants uh, sent in an early email saying, you've got to talk about this plant. And um, it was early enough that I could get it in there. And this is goutweed or bishop's wheat. I have been in more... Um, I, I want to call them, they're not legal uh, cases or anything, but more neighbor to neighbor upsets uh, because one of the neighbors wasn't controlling goutweed and it moved into a neighbor's yard uh, because this is a pretty aggressive perennial plant. It's in the APAC family. So this is the carrot family. So that umbel, that, that picture of the inflorescence is very typical of our, you know, think about Queen Anne's lace, for example, make, you know. This is where you know we have a lot of these these species. You know, uh, wild parsnip is in there. Uh, giant hogweed, of course, which is problematic and on its own. Um, leaves are grouped in three. Sometimes people confuse them with poison ivy, but they're not um, not as glossy. Uh, typically, and don't turn turn red. Um, the rhizomes are the problem. Um, people, you know, have planted these. Generally, plant them in shaded areas. They're a bit like the periwinkles, where nothing grows. This plant will grow. The problem is it's taken over our forest understories and moved into other areas. I should mention there are varieties, and these are usually the variegated white green varieties that are less aggressive. Um, so if you do like this plant and you would like to plant it in a shaded area, try to look and ask the folks in the nurseries of the uh, variegated, um, you know, white, green, less aggressive 
uh, form of this of this plant. The the wild or the, the fully green is very very aggressive, um, and so um, the concern is now they've they've moved into to other fields. Um, again, people have I've seen a whole bunch of ways to manage non chemical control again for flower beds and so forth. Um, yes, uh, that was actually a point that I was going to make that the um, what has happened in some cases as much I just mentioned the variegated variety. Um, in some cases, um, some of the wild uh, features or traits of the variegated um, are let loose in some cases, and I have seen it, and, and the, uh, the uh, viewer is absolutely correct that sometimes they will revert back to the green. And, and we're trying to get a handle on why that is, what, what, what is happening? Is it the shade? What does it? But that's a good point to be made. You, you're not totally safe by, by having, but there are certain varieties that I know have been tested to a greater degree and, and tend to be a, a little safer. Um, frequent mowing again will will help out. Uh, tarping, I've seen tarping along, uh, you know, uh, brick walls where people have plured because again, this plant loves shaded areas. Um, and uh, it is spread by seed a problem too. Typically not as problematic. Um, it will produce seedlings. I've seen a few, but it's by far, it's vegetative, the rhizomes. Um, so, I mean, it's always good not to let it go to seed by mowing it, but it's really going to be the, the rhizomes uh, that are, and again, even leaving a couple of rhizomes digging, I've dug it out of my place and I actually sift through and remove each of the rhizomes. I still get a few coming up, but being persistent and on top of it uh, works. Again, um, most of the two herbicides that I'm most familiar with that, that have worked and, and people have used this Roundup, again, non-selective, but this plant is so aggressive. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of the question regarding uh, mowing it and, and having it in the compost, um, if it hasn't seeded, I don't know. And, and again, there might be some listeners that might have a better idea. I don't know if it has any a little pathic traits, i.e. does it release any chemical? Sometimes that's one of the, the issues when I think about throwing this in a compost. Um, certainly if there are any of the viewers that might know or have done it where they've actually included in compost, I'd love to hear from you. Um, usually if I don't know, I try not to do it. I, I, I'm a conservative on that end. I'd rather not compromise my compost at all, you know, totally, but um, it, I'd love to hear if anybody has any other ideas about this, uh, this scout weed. And again, um, Roundup has been very effective. Um, the problem that I ran into in this uh, neighbor to neighbor was that one of the neighbors was organic, uh, didn't want to know anything about Roundup and the neighbor on the other side of the fence was spraying it. And uh, part of it was that there might've been some carryover and damage. And I had to kind of, uh, you know, try to, to help both of them out with, with both, uh, chemical, non-chemical control. I think they we reached a, an amicable agreement in terms of tarping and in, in the future. But um, but these do these products do work and, and there might be um there might be others. Um yes. Uh so so actually uh, uh one of the the viewers made a good point and that's true for many of our invasives, particularly if they don't have seed. If you would like to bag these and 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 solarize them, i.e., put them in in black plastic bags, all the residue if you're mowing, and then put them like on asphalt or on a cement and let them on sunny days, let them sit there. After a week or two, they have been basically fried, and they would be um, just fine to be able to add to your compost and add some of that organic matter. So that that's a that's a good point to be made. The one species I usually don't try to do that, yeah, I don't, you know, and I know it's it's is uh, which is not an invasive in, in this sense, but um, common purslane, Portulaca oleracea, because it's got so much water um, in there in those leaves and in that stem, that succulent stem, that that even you know a week or two, especially in the Ithaca area, we tend to have a lot of cloudy days, uh, but in but it doesn't work, but. That was a good point that I just wanted to to make sure that that some of the some of you, if you're interested, absolutely would is a great way to kind of uh, make use of that residue that that you remove. Common reed is one that's uh, that's just um, we see it everywhere. It's 
on roadsides, and you'll see, you know, in the next slide, many of you are familiar with this plant. Those rhizomes are huge. How many of you have seen this kind of a longer? I mean, this stuff is moving into the asphalt, and obviously, uh, Department of Transportation folks are very familiar with this plant. Um, you know, problematic from a road perspective. Uh, not much wildlife can can actually, uh, you know, get in there. It's they're so thick. Um, it's it's very tolerant to salt. That's why you see it along the ditches, saline conditions and and can lift up lift up those rhizomes can actually lift up asphalt so and it's you know drying out marshes i mean it's one that we folks have been working for a long time here in in certainly new york and and in the northeast again a number of options again it all depends on the the severity and how large the infestation is and, you know some of these cutting below the you know small stands yes you could do that um you know plastic tarps i've seen that uh burning uh, again, prescribed burns, but again, being very, very careful. Um, you know, not and you know, not to 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 have the 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 fire get out of get out of control, particularly along roadsides. Uh, that isn't you know, you often don't get to, to go ahead. But um, the main method that I've seen uh, that's been effective is is really uh, you know herbicidal control for some of these large large uh, populations. Um, I must have forgotten to include my. My slide on on uh, on on herbicides to use very similar to what you have uh, you, you got to see uh, glyphosate is by far uh, the choice because often these are monospecific stands and i.e. there it's just that plant by itself and uh, it is going to be repeated the DOT folks that I've worked with often tell me this is mowing repeated mowing and I mean four or five times a year over multiple seasons seems to have kind of you know, put it at bay. Um, but in any case, like Yana's looking at me, which means I probably <laughs> should stop here, take a little break. Take yeah, some I was going to say that that was a lot of information. It's uh, it's a wonderful download of expertise in a short amount of time. So um, you can tell a lot of a lot of life has gone into producing those slides and the ability to talk about them. So we've actually already answered some questions as we've been going through. Um, but I'm going to pick out a, just a couple of them that are in the Q&A. Um, and two people have asked if you have a seed list um, and uh, what do you recommend reseeding when you've cleared an area of invasives? And um, do you have an, some suggestions on that? And maybe we can give links to people, you know, afterwards. Right. Um, off the top, I I don't have per se. There are certain you know species. I mean, obviously, there are going to be folks actually um, listening in today that have probably some good idea of what some some seed mixes that have worked for them. Um, in 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 our case, I mean, if you don't reseed, not only sometimes do you get the invasive species coming in, but you also get some of our naturalized species, which are not as necessarily as bad but if you're really trying to you know reseed native species uh you know that would be that would be um you know we would have to look at some of the native species you know lists that are are available um again i noticed uh yeah uh ernst seeds actually that's a company that we're working with um not necessarily not necessarily to uh they're out of uh, western pennsylvania um, they, uh, we're working with them actually trying to increase biodiversity in cropping systems in field edges, uh, around, uh, corn and soybean fields to increase, um, you know, pollinators and so forth. Um, but obviously they're, they're mixes and they have a whole bunch of the different mixes for differing. If you want more milkweed in there, if you want more pollinator friendly. So Ernst again would be one. I'm sure there are other companies as well. One of the things that I'll say, we usually try to include in a mix a pretty, uh, at least one species or a couple of species that are fast growing, fast establishing, usually grasses, fast, you know, not necessarily fescues, but certainly a, a number of grasses that could really um, germinate quickly. Like, for example, if you have milkweeds, they're kind of slow to grow and any weeds in the seed bank or that invasive species you're trying to control is going to just outcompete it. So trying to get something in there um, to, to kind of nurse these, these species along. And often in these mixes that you purchase, they have included that in there. Um, mm -hmm. So I know people are making some, some suggestions there uh, regarding, yeah. regarding mixes, but, um, but again, right. Just leaving those bare, it, that's, that's going to be a, a problem. So uh, ideally, and again, 
you might need to to keep an eye out for at least that first year of establishment uh, you know to try to get in there and try to remove any uh, remaining invasive uh, plants that are there because you're you're likely still going to have them but over time hopefully those seed mixes will do the job and then a question here from Stephen Wood do pre-emergent herbicides kill all seeds uh, uh pre-emergent herbicides do not pre-emergent herbicides do none of the herbicides actually kill the seeds what they kill so when we call pre-emergence what they what they do is that the seed has to germinate and you know often you'll see if you've planted things the radical it's a little white protrusion that comes out of the seed that's actually it's called the radical that's actually the precursor for roots so once the, the, the seed has imbibed, taken in water, it takes in the herbicide. But if a seed is, you know, is, is hard seeded, it's not, it hasn't been stimulated to germinate, those herbicides will not kill those seeds. So mm -hmm. they will only kill what, what, what seeds have, you know, basically have, are stimulated to, to grow and to swell, then they'll take the herbicide. So that's a good point. None of these herbicides will kill seeds and the seeds can, if they're dormant, the term we use, they're dormant. They're there, they're not dead, but they're not going to be taking up the herbicide. So yes, uh, and that's a great strategy for, for weeds. Great. And uh, three people have asked about shrubs. When are we going to get to shrubs and buckthorn and multiflora rose? So I'm going to suggest we carry on because okay. we're, we're about to enter that territory. So. Oh, oh, how could you not worry about the honeysuckles? Uh, I've been fighting these guys on my place in my hedgerow for a long time. I think I have Tartarian honeysuckle and Machiai. There are a whole bunch, but I've, I've grouped them together. I think most of you know um, uh, these species. Uh, of course, deer like them. They are, uh, you also will know that they're the pretty well the first species in our region to leaf out, and they're the last species to lose their leaves. And there's been some really nice work looking at as our uh, growing season has expanded how these plants have actually, you know, uh, become even more problematic and, and longer lived and they have a much more longer period of uh, growing period. So again, opposite leaves um, and, and uh, again, those berries, they can vary from orange to red to yellow, uh, depending on, on the species. Birds love these, as you know, they, that's part of the reason. You'll often see these seedlings of these plants right below a fence. You have a fence around your garden. I know I have it. And you wonder, what's that? Well, that's the birds that are perching and their droppings are going, you know, and I'm finding these in my garden. And I go, how did they get there? That's how they got there. So birds are, are major. I mean, this is the kind of thing um, you're likely to see. One key thing is they're not very shade tolerant. So they need to be, get light. So that's why often you see them in kind of forest edges you know, in the what we call the ecotone region between a, a grassland and the forested areas and, you know, open areas uh, and, uh, you know, roadsides and so forth. So um, that's something we want, you know, you, you rarely see them in an intact forest. They just can't handle those, those, those conditions. So I'm not saying they can't grow in there. Um, so uh, I have done pretty well all of these non-chemical uh, control strategies. Um, hand pull them. When they're small, I tried to pull one that was like very thick, couldn't do it. There's where you, you're going to use a skid steer. And I just put a chain and just pulled it right out. I mean, completely pulled it out. But not everybody can, you know, wants or can do this. Um, I've also, for very large ones, I've just kept cutting right at the base. And yes, the plant will com keep coming up. There's no question about it. If you cut it, and unless you, you, you know, we call it cut stump application of a herbicide. You cut it and then you apply the herbicide right on the stump and that herbicide will take it up. That will work and I'll show you in the next slide. But uh, in my case, I didn't want to use a herbicide. So I basically have, I chopped them all back to the ground and repeated cutting, even with clippers, um, you know. Um, oh, there's, yeah, that's right. The honeysuckle peppers to remove. Yeah, just just drag these, these guys totally out. Um, uh, people have burned these, uh, prescribed burns will take care of the seedlings. Seedlings are pretty prominent in this plant. So, uh, often right under the plant, you will see just a carpet of these seedlings. 
And that's an indication that, you know, the berries are dropping and they're also be being carried. Um, I've had success with the repeated mowing, but I have small infestations. The, the herbicides um, work. I mean, that's, that's uh, the choice in many cases. Um, again, some of these, what's nice is they're selective in some cases, uh, tricopyr in, in, in particular. Uh, but the you notice there the, the bottom uh, part cut stump or basal bark uh, treatment. So you can do that year round. You basically cut the, the, the stem off or the, uh, you know, the bark, you apply a, a glyphosate, a, what we call a systemic herbicide that's gonna be taken up by the plant. And that's very effective. The problem of course is, you know, how large is your infestation and can, can you do it? But I have seen teams uh, of, of land managers, you know, removing areas. This is what they do, cut, and then come come with the with the herbicide, and this is this is an effective way if you don't want to just just keep cutting it back. Um, uh, yeah, and there's some great comments about if you want these wrenches. Uh, it looks like uh, CCE in Tompkins County has those available to the public. I wish I had known that because I know I could have used it. Um, the the other species that's that's uh, also problematic to buckthorns, uh, ramnus species. We have two. Um, one is the, the common buckthorn, and that's uh, the image to your left, bottom left. Um, it's opposite, uh, opposite to the leaves. So one way you could tell it's got teeth along the margins of the leaves. Might be hard to tell there. And it's a monoecious species, which means both the male and female flowers are on the same plant. And then there's the glossy, some people call it, uh, often call it too, also kind of the European buckthorn. Um, and uh, it's uh, those are uh, alternate leaves. So the alternate leaves and the um, and it's dioecious species. OK, and there is there the there are no teeth along the margins of the leaves. And dioecious just means that you have both separate male plants and female plants. So the sexes are separated uh, with these species, but they're very problematic. They're made, they produce many, many seedlings. That's something you really have to watch. Again, uh, deer love those, those berries. And again, birds as well. And the, uh, you know, you will find these uh, able to invade forest interiors. So a little different than the, the honeysuckles is that they can get in the interior. And, you know, obviously if there's a tree comes down, they, they prefer, you know, lot better light, but they can, they can, they can handle it. Um, and again, the common buckthorn, I think that's true, a general, you know, uh, truth that they're in drier areas. So the common buckthorn, the one with the serrated leaves tends to be in drier areas, the glossy, usually in wet, wet areas, but that's kind of a generalization. We do have both of these in our region, kind of in the Northeast. So depending, and often you'll see the two of them, uh, you know, you'll get to see the two of them together. So. Um, in terms of control, uh, again, very similar um, situation to, um, you know, cut stem, stump type uh, applications of these. Um, yes, uh, that's, that's, yeah, the honeysuckles. In fact, uh, they, I was just reading a comment done in Virginia that the honeysuckles um, have also started to move uh, to move in the interior, you know, uh, we are starting to see more and more of that. All the, so these generalizations that I make do not be surprised if you have situations like this. And uh, unfortunately, with some of the climate change that's occurring, um, these species are taking greater advantage than many of our native species. So um, again, um, I have seen actually goats do a great job on, on these if they're not too high, um, you know, uh, burning seems to, to, to work. Um, again, mowing is an option mostly for, for, you know, seedlings, obviously chopping these, these plants using wrenches to pull them very similar to the, to the honeysuckles. Uh, but just, uh, just problematic species. And I should mention that our, uh, our agri, you know, farmers also are concerned about these plants because they're also, um, uh, alternate hosts for some, major insects and diseases. Uh, so farmers and, and growers do not like to have them around their orchards or their you know pastures or their crop cropland species. 
uh, soybean aphid. There's a bunch of, of, of diseases and insect pests now that, that use this plant as an alternate host. So um, a bunch of reasons, again, cut stump or basal bark treatments are, are um, uh, valuable. Um, and again, uh, a, a whole range of, of herbicides for those of you. And often, um, you know, we indicate when it's the best time to, to spray them. Obviously, actively growing uh, species uh, or, or individuals is the, is the best way to do it, actively growing. Uh, where I've seen failures uh, of, from herbicide applications has been basically when, when, you know, we were in drought conditions, not a good time to apply these. Or you know temperatures were really really cold and people wanted to get ahead of the game or late in the season when when you know fall kind of comes through. So um, hopefully here you get an idea of some of these these products that can be used, but very very effective in terms of if if one wants to wants to use them. Um, oh, how could we not forget about multiflora rose again? Uh, a sad story about this plant, or not so sad, is that it was planted purposely by a number of agencies to for uh, erosion control and as a fence rows between uh, agricultural fields and even um, you know to separate land uh, from one owner to the other. And uh, lo and behold, not surprising, it's become a major major problem. I know I have it in my place. Just hate the plant. It's beautiful, but I hate it with those spines, uh, very large thickets. Um, and uh, you might take a look at the, uh, I talked about the stipules on the leaf stalks. One way you could tell it from many of the other roses is that if you look at the, the picture of those leaves and stem at the top right, if you look at where the branchlet meets the, the, the main stem, there looks like there's like some caterpillar or some insect on there. That's the stipule, those fringed hairs, that, that's a characteristic of the multiflora rose that will give it away. Um, of, often you will see the, you know, of the white flowers, it's beautiful when it's in, in flower and then it'll form those hispids or those little red, um, you know, uh, fruits that will, um, you know, have, you know, provide seeds. These plants, as some of you might have seen, once they land, they can root as the branches over top, they root and they, that's how the plant also expands, not just from leaves, uh, but also, um, you know, have been, have been taking care of, of, of uh, these plants. Um, one thing I'll mention, I think I mentioned it uh, last time, um, and, and I, this is the comment that uh, uh, Libhart uh, Trilby mentioned, is that it, this plant is also susceptible to uh, along with our uh, Rosa genus species, many of our, our, our cultivated roses to um, a, a rose rosette disease, uh, which is a, a, a virus um, that is, is actually, uh, um, well, it's, it's actually a mite that is the vector for this virus. And I know I have it on my place. And basically what you, if, if you are not familiar, you just have to Google, you know, rose rosette disease and it's actually uh, half of the stand at my place over three years, that disease has taken out. I just have now bare branches um, and I wish I should have included a photo. Um, and I certainly didn't spread that around. Obviously my neighbors who have roses are very concerned because this will also go after cultivated rose, but rose rosette disease seems to be doing a number uh, and might be localized. And again, I'd be interested to hear if some of you are seeing this in your regions. Um, and um, I've actually had some uh, students in my weeds class say, you know, hey, can you bring me some of the infected branches? I'd like to spread this to this very healthy stand at home. And I'm, I'm not sure how that would work, but um, again, it's a very problematic uh, species, very difficult to eradicate. Uh, so um, typically we try to focus from it spreading to other areas. Um, again, brush mowing multiple times um, will kill, um, you know, uh, large or at least small infestations, uh, digging up the roots again, only if, if you have small. Um, will grazing uh, by goats, if anybody's had some experience with them, I have seen 
some pretty good control by goats. Uh, I was in Pennsylvania in uh, North Central Pennsylvania and and a, and a orchardist showed me um, what his goats had done to the multiflora and I, it was pretty impressive. He just had the canes left, which was, uh, you know, and he was gonna then brush those out and, and replant. So, um, but the seeds will are long lived. So keep that in mind. Um, foliar applications have certainly worked. Um, again, very, some of the same suspects and as we've seen in many of our, um, you know, uh, other uh, brush type uh, species invasives, these are commonly used uh, to try to control the, these species. Uh, like I said, unfortunately, um, the this is an aggressive species, produces, you know, uh, seeds and can reroot very easily, but um, we've learned our lesson not to plant this uh, purposely as, um, and, and which is a reminder that uh, that was the same for kudzu, by the way. Kudzu was brought in as a forage legume and uh, look at what it's done down south and now it's moving in our region in the northeast so um i know there's a lot there and you know i i, I wish i could you know i could spend uh, a whole hour just you know getting into the basics of each of these species but i'm i'm hoping that the kind of overview um has uh, that this has provided gives you an overview of like okay what do i need what what have people tried especially for those of you who are just kind of, you know, learning a little more about these species and, and how to control them. Obviously, there are folks here that have a lot of expertise. Um, and again, I welcome comments from those. Like I say, I learn a ton from folks that have been on the ground in the trenches and kind of provide both what has worked and what hasn't. But some general takeaways, and, you know, I typically end my, my classes with, okay, what, are, you know, what have we done in the last hour? What should we think about? Persistence. I mean, I, I I wish I could have that easy solution. Just do this, and it's gone, and it's it's not going to happen. You know, most of these repeated control, multiple times during the season, multiple years, is is you know for for extensive you know infestations, it's going to do it. Particularly for non chemical control, but also chemical control. Um, again, systemic herbicides and. A systemic herbicide is a herbicide that's basically applied to the foliage, to the leaves, and it is taken up by the plant. Okay, they often are not applied to the soil. They need like Roundup. If you apply Roundup to the to the soil or glyphosate, it has no activity. It's going to just be absorbed by the soil, absorbed by the soil. So you need herbicides that are taken in by the plant. And I should mention that that's one of the reasons why you know, some people say, look, I sprayed glyphosate or, or some of these uh, non-selective herbicides, um, you know, and it's a week and I'm just barely seeing, you know, an effect. You have to realize that the herbicides cannot kill the plant too quickly because what happens? If it kills the plant too quickly, the transport system is going to be shut down. And so that herbicide is not going to get to where you want it, which is below ground into those rhizomes, tubers, those roots for those perennials. So the herbicide has to kind of basically trick the plant into saying, hey, I'm gonna hitch a ride along with uh, the food you're providing to the roots and I'm gonna, and, and hopefully get to where it's gonna do his damage. So this is different from what we call a contact herbicide that's applied, basically uh, it will kill whatever it comes into in, in, in contact with. Um, you know, paraquat is a perfect example. Not that we, you know, and some people use it. And timing matters. Late season operations can reduce seed production. So if you've got a species that produces seed or if it's a primary, like something like Japanese steel grass, keeping it from producing seed is obviously a win-win. You've got to be able to do that. But for those species that have both, um, at least, you know, like a swallowwort that expands from, uh, you know, the root nodes and so forth, um, at least trying to reduce uh, seed production will work. For uh, herbicide applications, as I mentioned, late fall or in the fall when the plant is translocating all that energy to below ground to prepare for the winter is usually effective, but be careful if the temperatures can be too cold or if you're in drought conditions. And in the spring, some of you are getting, you know, inching to get out there and be spraying. If you're gonna be spraying a herbicide, particularly systemic, make sure there's enough foliage. Don't spray just one leaf of uh, you know, Johnson grass or, or, or whatever species, because that's not gonna have enough tissue to take up enough herbicide to kill that extensive below ground. So make sure you've got, and often on the herbicide label, say spray when the plant is at this stage or has this many leaves. 
So for those of you who are kind of new to herbicide use, keep that in mind. And that's also true for, for uh, you know, cutting or mowing. Allow enough vegetation to, to emerge and then chop it and repeat that every two or three weeks. The plant's going to regrow again, put all that energy, and you'll keep chopping it. You're going to exhaust those, those reserves. And that's many of our organic growers. That's kind of what they do. So with that, um, I guess... I'll pass it over to Yana, and if there's um, some other, you know, questions or we have a bit of time, I'd be happy to kind of, you know, yes. answer some more questions. Great, and yeah, we can we we have time for a couple of questions, and there's way more than we can possibly uh, answer. Um, and uh, there is a question. Um, um, there was a lot of questions. I'm sorry. Um, there's one actually um, that maybe we can maybe go through this afterwards is for herbicide recommendations. Are you noting which products are available for homeowner application and which can only be applied by certified applicators? And um, so that um, I don't know if that's on the slides or could be on the slides. It would be helpful for people. Um, yeah, that, I was going to say, Yana, that's a great point, because some of you obviously are more, uh, you know, homeowners, uh, you know, backyard, you're not, because you're absolutely right. And um, I'll see if I can add some information. I mean, some of the, you know, you, even glyphosate, you're not going to get a, a like what we call a 42 percent, uh, you know, concentration uh, at, at Lowe's or your local, uh, you know, uh, hardware store. So uh, that's a good point to be made. Uh, but generally speaking, um, I'll try to include maybe some of that information for the kind of like, you know, for large, you know, uh, certified applicators and maybe for kind of homeowner, this is what the option will be. Many of these are available in kind of your, you know, Lowe's and, and, and box stores, but uh, the difference is that the concentration is generally reduced. Um, and so obviously it doesn't have as the active ingredient is not at a high enough, well, high enough concentration. It's High enough, but again, it's a little more conservative, but great point. And I'll try to see if we can add that information in and, and post it. Okay, great. And uh, Matthew Blay asked a question about soil solarization in agricultural settings. We actually did a webinar on that uh, in the last year. So I'm going to suggest, Matthew, that, uh, that, um, that you could check that out and I'll put the link in that uh, later. And um, also there's a question about whether the Weeds of the Northeast book discusses weed management techniques. We also did a webinar uh, with Tony on that a while ago. So I'll put the link to, um, to that webinar in there. Um, there is a question here about, um, um, about, can you burn most of these invasives in your fire pit? You know, if you were to chop them and then put them in the fire pit to burn, um, is that possible? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know kind of uh, local uh, fire laws and, and and but if the question is, you know, are 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 there issues with toxicity, you know, for example, if I would burn, you know, uh, something like uh, poison ivy, uh, would that could that be problematic? I I am not aware apart from uh, you know, possibly things like uh, you know, giant hogwood, uh, you know, uh, hogweed and and some of these a couple of the APACA that I know have furanocumarins, which which can be volatile when burnt. Uh, I'm not sure that these some of these cannot be. I mean, certainly, you know, burning uh, the honeysuckles, the the buckthorn, uh, multiflora rose. I don't. I've never had uh, any issues or heard of any issues with with burning those. So if if anybody. Uh, is aware or would like to share, uh, you know, knowledge on that, I'd be happy because those are, you know, really relevant questions, actually, just like, hey, do I, can I put this in my compost? And we talked about maybe solarizing them in plastic bags first, and then, you know, including them in. So um, I am not aware, but I'd be, if somebody has a resource or knows, feel free to to post it and, and folks can can look it up. But great question, though, often asked. All right. And John Mitchell asked, do pre-emergent herbicides kill all developing germinated seeds where the radical is developing? Question mark. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, pre-emergent herbicides will will kill as as long as the seed has imbibed or swelled and is taking in water. That swelling, just like man, when you plant your beans, you know, sometimes people put them in water the night before so they're ready to go. 
that swelling, yes. And the radical, and, and so when you apply the herbicide, it's usually on the soil surface for pre-emergent herbicides. Usually a rain or water is required to kind of wash that through the soil profile to where the seeds are. And as soon as that herbicide comes into contact with the radical, with the little, you know, uh, premature root or gets into the seed, they're dead. Uh, particularly, you know, things like pendimethalin, uh, you know, or, or some of these these herbicides that that work. So as soon as the seed is active, it's it's the dormant seeds. It's those seeds that are hard seeded that have not received the germination stimulation. They haven't received the light, the conditions to swell. Those will not be killed. So that's really important to keep in mind. So they're alive, they're viable, but they're just not going to germinate. They're going to be there for who knows how long. Okay. And Susan Cromwell um, asked, what are your thoughts on using high nitrogen fertilizer um, on gout weed? Only, only nitrogen. I find spreading the granules on the plants right before a rain causes them to burn and die back successfully. I don't use it in my garden because it'll kill other plants, but it seems to work well in larger areas. Well, that's a great, I, I had never heard of that. Uh, so again, I've learned something I didn't know. Um, I guess uh, you know it 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 could it could work. Uh, I could also, you know, the the issue there is, you know, that the nitrogen leaching. I mean, if it's especially over large areas, uh, and and one thing to keep in mind, the many weeds and many invasives are nitrophilous. They actually love nitrogen. So I wonder if, um, you know, that could be problematic down the road. I'm not saying that it didn't work for you, but I wonder if it's kind of a repeated operation. Uh, for example, you can also use a salt saline solution uh, and, and you could you could you could do that um, and you would spray it or vinegar some people. But, it, you know, um, but not to say that it didn't work. It's something something new, but usually it's the other way around. We want to keep nitrogen away from weeds. We always say in kind of the ag world, we say feed the crop, not the weeds. And uh, I mean, this is not the exact same situation here, but I can imagine that it'll it'll burn right burn this these plants down. Um, they'll probably come back again, but if it's working for you and it's not causing any non-target impacts, absolutely. This is it's great to know. Great, and uh, this will probably be the last question. Uh, there's loads of great questions, and um, and maybe Tony can choose one last one for himself. But anyway, this is uh, from Renee Stoops, and she said, "Has anyone ever tried soil steaming on Japanese knotweed?" We have a portable soil steamer meant for use in high tunnels to organically control weeds and diseases. We're thinking of doing a trial on a riparian section of Japanese knotweed. Oh, I, uh, yeah, I, I, it's interesting you're, you're mentioning that because I, we had a question from a local grower, organic grower that wanted to steam in between, uh, you know, or at least rows of blueberries. Um, I mean, it's it's expensive, first of all. I mean, steaming is an expensive, uh, but if you have it, I'm just wondering, I don't know if the rhizomes are gonna be impacted. I, and I am not aware of any research that's been done on on uh, steaming in, in riparian areas, particularly, you know, um, in this case for, for Japanese knobweed. Um, I, Depending on how deep those rhizomes are and the kind of temperatures, um, you know. Uh, oh, this is a great one. You know, not we grows on volcanoes. Well, then I think maybe we've got the answer there. Uh, but I'd love to know uh, if you know, and maybe you know, even shooting me or or we can post that if 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 you do go, you know, I the, the temperature generally drops fairly quickly through the soil profile. Um, that's from some general work that, that, that folks have done on steaming. Uh, and, and again, depending on, you know, being in a riparian area, it could be a moist, there'd be water, the more water there is, the less, you know, heat, you know, there's more resistance. So not to say that it wouldn't work, but I'd love to see if, you know, if you do try it on a, in, a, in a couple of spots or regions, I'd love to know what the results are. Just like with some of the work we're doing on periwinkle, I'd like to share this, you know, our results with, with folks, you know, both chemical, non-chemical. So um, give it a shot. But after seeing the fact that they grow on volcanoes, I kind of like, oh, um, yeah. 
let's 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 try it out i mean a small small scale even just to see i'd love to hear from you right and there's one last biological control uh comment question um there's a psyllid insect that attacks japanese knotweed to be introduced as a biological control it looks like it's very successful in the uk where it was introduced earlier and um so i don't know if you had heard about that or uh, have any comments on that yeah, I mean, I do know of the work in the UK, and I was under the impression, I'm not sure if, and some of you in the audience might know, if uh, APHIS has approved its release here in the Northeast. I know there are a couple of uh, researchers in the Northeast that are very focused on the psyllid. Um, if it's not here, if it's not yet been released, which in May, it's certainly going through APHIS, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, which is the government federal body that oversees the importation of, of, of biocontrol agents. Um, so they over make sure that you know they're safe and they, they do what they're supposed to do. But uh, I did see that uh, it, it's working. That would be fantastic. The, the other thing I'll just end with, given that this is the Northeast IPM Center that's sponsoring this, I think one thing you'll keep in mind is that really there is no one solution to any of these plants and really you need to be thinking holistically and many of you do i know that um in terms of integrated pest management and it's really really important to understand the biology non-chemical tactics if you need to resort to chemical tactics use be judicious in the use of these products um, and use those that obviously have the least impact non-target impacts there's no question these products are effective in many ways. And, and I want to make sure that they're used properly and that we don't lose these chemicals out of our toolbox for those that, that you know, want to use them. I mean, obviously, there's a big part of the uh, sector of the population. That's not the direction that they want. And that's totally fine. We'll fo we, we focus on, on non, non chemical strategies. But where I've seen the most success is really an integration, thinking broadly. Why is this plant even here? You know, what am I doing that's allowing this plant to flourish here? So understanding the biology, ecology, and then what are some things that we can do to modify the environment so that this plant isn't there, you know? And I, obviously for those of you who are land managers and you're dealing with hundreds of acres, if not thousands, it's, it's, it's a big challenge. And I certainly, you know, uh, appreciate, you know, what you're all doing and we're trying to get some information, you know, out to you guys. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention before I go is that uh, I want to thank two of my uh, members of my lab, Sophie Westbrook and Rebecca Stoop, who actually put together the presentation. Um, faculty and professors get off easy because we've got some great, amazing graduate students that kind of do the work, but it's something they're also very interested in. So I just wanted to mention that. And obviously to thank Yana and the whole Northeast IPM Center for giving me a chance to to talk to you again, take a look at the uh, weeds of the Northeast. Uh, to answer the question, no, there are no management, uh, you know, in management information. It's really a, an identification guide. Uh, that's why kind of hand in hand. But the um, manage weeds on your farm uh, ecological approaches is very much focused on non-chemical management of the 65 mostly agronomic species, but some of them are you'll be very familiar on your on your garden. So. Um, with that, I uh, thank you all. It's hopefully we have a great growing season, no late frosts uh, that wipe out our orchards like we've had here in uh, upstate New York last year. Um, and and again, uh, I'll end with there are three certainties in life, um, you know, uh, taxes, death, and weeds. I guarantee you, we can have, you know, so job security. But no, just kidding aside. Thank you all for taking time. I know you, you've got busy schedules. Um, if any of you have additional questions, I'd be happy. I'll take a look at the chat and uh, the questions and, and try to get back to each of you. But thanks again for your time. Yeah, lovely. Well, thank you for everything and your expertise. And it's very it's it's very nice to hear that you have weeds in your garden too, and they're not all totally eradicated. And and uh, so if Tony Di Tommaso is battling weeds still in his garden, then you know it may, it makes more space for the rest of us to <laughs> to be dealing with what we're dealing with. I'll just say, Yana, that it's uh, you'll get this really surprised look from my neighbor saying, how could you be a wheat scientist and look at your lawn? And I have to just pause and 
not really answer because right. we'd have some issues. Wonderful. So, um, so yes, there is a poll up with four questions. We'd really appreciate it if you could answer those questions because uh, it helps us uh, each time that uh, we apply for money from USDA NIFA for um, for for allowing us to put these webinars on for you. Um, when you pay your taxes this spring, this was part of your taxes. So, um, so remember that. And uh, and I am going to say it's complete in probably about 10 seconds. And there's a couple of other slides we want to share with you. Um, people were asking if the um, um uh, if people were asking uh, if there's a recording will be available, yes, in about a week, uh, we'll do a little bit of editing and add some uh, links and those kind of things. Um, and uh, I will send an email to everybody who has registered. So even if um, you know someone who hasn't been here today, but you think they would like it, tell them to register anyway. And then when we uh, put together Together the list next week, uh, they will get a copy of the recording. And we'll also include a copy of the recording that the last one that Tony did. So someone just asked if we can share the poll again. And so, yes, I would be happy to do that. Uh, so how knowledgeable are you about the biology of troublesome invasive species in the Northeast? And uh, we have more moderates and more berries, I think. Um, and uh, uh, how to manage, um, a lot more people are in the moderately and varied category, and um, and uh, and then how, uh, how likely are you to use IPM, and a lot of people have fallen into the moderately and very knowledgeable category, um, and uh, oh, I'm really heartened to see that as a result of this webinar, how likely are you to increase your implementation of IPM, and we have 18% uh, in the extremely likely and 50% in very likely. So that's an excellent uh, thank you. So I'm just going to go through a couple of uh, things that would, might be of interest or to you. We have two more um, uh, webinars that are coming up. Actually, uh, one I'm putting together as we speak. But um, so March 11th, there's the use of IPM in beekeeping to control parasitic varroa mites. Um, the end of March the 25th, there's one on kosher, halal, and insects, and how do they relate, which should be very interesting. Um, and uh, then I'm, it's not on here yet, but um, on April 11th, uh, Brian Nolt is doing a presentation on onion thrips and some research that he's done um, in 20 sites in New York on controlling onion thrips and uh, increasing revenue in the, in the farms that did that. So... Um, so I will also mention that in the follow-up email. So uh, we have a website uh, uh, where you can find colleagues. So if you are really into weeds, and there are other people in the Northeast who are really into weeds, and this is a way that you can find each other. We set it up as a way so that if you're looking for a research partner, maybe you're, um, you know, you have some agricultural or forest land, and you're interested in participating on in in research, um, then you would be able to find colleagues. So uh, you post a profile at this particular link and um, and you can find colleagues at this link. And it's been growing nicely over the years. So um, please uh, feel, feel free to look there and also post uh, who you are and what you'd be interested in collaborating uh, with. Um, the recording, as I said, will be here in about a week. Um, and I also want to do two acknowledgements, one, is that the Northeastern IPM Center is based at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayokono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayokono are members of the Haudenosaunee Feder Feder Confederacy, an alliance of six nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayokono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gayokono people, past and present um, and future, to these lands and waters. This land acknowledgement has been reviewed and approved by the traditional Gayokono leadership. And also, I want to acknowledge that our funding uh, for the center and these webinars comes through USDA NIFA. And um, so we appreciate uh, everybody's presence here today. 
And uh, most importantly, just appreciate uh, that Tony uh, DiTomaso has a very busy schedule and a huge wealth of knowledge and enthusiasm for his topic. And uh, just incredibly grateful for this presentation and for your students and for you and uh, your leadership in this and and uh, very much appreciated. And I can tell by the by the comments in there that people uh, appreciated it very much. So thank you. And uh, thank you. Yeah. And to everyone that's in the sunny Northeast, go, go have some lunch outside and, and enjoy this blue sky and sunshine and warmth. So, okay. All right. Thank you.